This is the One Million Lives Podcast by Laramie. Listen to healthcare professionals, healthcare educators, and survivors share their best practices and what they've learned from these experiences. At Lairdall, it's our goal to help save one million more lives every year by 2030. One life at a time. Welcome to this special event episode of the One Million Lives podcast by Lairdall. In this episode, we will take you to the 2023 Congress of the Society for Simulation in Europe, or CESOM for short, which was held this past June in sunny Lisbon, in Portugal. We are standing here at the Centro de Congresso de Lisboa, where we, over the next three days, will enjoy an extensive program of lectures and workshops and even a simulation competition, which I'm sure will interest many of you. I'm standing here with my co-host, Michael Sauter. So, Michael, after talking to many of the participants here already, it strikes me that there is like a new energy in this society, a positive energy of some sort. Perhaps it's just the fact that COVID has lost its, its uh, grip but uh, I have a feeling there is something more. What do you think? Well, interesting you're saying that, Bjorn. A uh, uh, first sort of uh, thing I'm noticing is that there are much many, many more people now. Uh, I don't know what, if that is due to COVID too, but it's crawling around here. A lot of people are walking around and smiley faces. And so, so that's certainly one thing. And, and uh, maybe you're right. Maybe there's a new vibe. I haven't been for the last few setups. But I can certainly see uh, how it's grown. And I think the program has uh, shifted a bit too. Interesting you say that because I ha- already have an appointment to talk with uh, the director of the programs here. And that's going to be quite interesting. I understand she's new. Mm-hmm. Um, and you also have an appointment already to talk later with uh, Elsa Soylan, who is the director of the Safer Simulation Center in Stavanger, uh, to hear some of her um, points of view, her experience, her, 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 um, and later you are going to speak with Elsa Söylan, who is the director of the Safer Simulation Center in Stavanger, who's also here. And that's going to be a bit interesting to hear what she thinks about this year's uh, program. After all, it's now five years since Safer were in Stavanger, and she was part of the organization local organization then yeah and and actually she's been at every sesame i believe since 2008 so she can really speak to how this has evolved and i'm looking forward to hear her impressions after the fact what was her sort of key things uh for taking back to her staff at the, at the safer center in stavanger in norway I also hope to speak to some of uh, the uh, lecturers or, or uh, managers of different uh, workshops uh, during uh, the um, event here in Lisbon and uh, maybe also with uh, some of the participants, um, which are from basically all over the world. That's fascinating because that's certainly a change. There were always a sort of an international uh, contribution or part- participation, but now it's from all over. Uh, truly. So it's become a truly international conference and uh, maybe that's the vibe. Maybe bringing so many people together from different countries will generate something new here. So without any further delay, let's start. I'm so looking forward to it. The program looks terrific. During this year's SESAM conference, we spoke to several participants who had attended past SESAM meetings. One comment that stuck out was that it was like a new wind blowing through the corridors here at the conference. It was like the forum had been reoxygenized. Wanting to check this out, we managed to get hold of uh, SESAM's new chair of the scientific committee, Professor Cristina Diaz Navarro. After welcoming her to the One Million Lives podcast by Lerdal, I asked her about the changes that were so apparent at this year's conference. Thank you very much, uh, Bjorn, for having us. Well, first thing to say that uh, it's my first year as chair of the scientific committee. And uh, as a scientific committee group, we have really made lots of changes to the way we work. 
Uh, first of all, we are bigger than ever. We are now 21 individuals who do review and select the scientific content and also chair the presentations. But we have changed the way that we accept abstracts. So we've changed the themes that people can submit their work under. And those include topics such as equity, diversity and inclusion, well-being, culture, as well as the traditionally scientific education uh, topics. We've also added a, a new stream for um, psychomotor skill training. And we've also added therapeutic uses of simulation. We're looking at all of the facets that are part of our educational practice and how uh, these can be reflected in the program for the benefit of our participants. Quality improvement has obviously been a much more dominant theme among the speakers at this year's SESAM conference than in the past. So I asked her if this was a new topic or theme for the SESAM conference. Quality improvement is not new, but I think that we're getting better at working together between educational working groups and quality improvement groups. We all bring something different to the mixture. And in fact, I have had the pleasure of being part of a collaboration between Health Education Improvement Wales, uh, ASPI and SESAM, so that uh, simulation groups and patient safety groups can uh, have a little bit of direction when designing simulation interventions after key events in healthcare. I wanted to see if I fully understood what she was saying. So I came up with this imaginary critical ill patient arriving at the emergency room in the hospital. The patient received the best possible treatment from the team uh, there and later was sent further into the hospital to the intensive care unit. Was I to understand that she suggested that the team could later recreate the situation with this patient in a simulated session as part of the incident evaluation with the opportunity to learn of mistakes and ensure and improve treatment next time? So that is definitely one of the options, but it's not the only way that we can do this. And perhaps what this framework helps us do is identify one situation, a key event, like the one that you have described. We have a very complex patient that has got perhaps a good outcome, but the situation has been challenging and we want to learn more about it. So we think, okay, how can simulation help? What is it that we want to look at? And is there anything that we can do from the simulation perspective that will help the next patient. And there are lots of things that we can do. We can test systems through simulation. We can do simulation training or, or, or even simulation process mapping. And that would be a bit like what you have explained. You would run the situation and see what you can learn from it. But we can also do uh, debriefing because as simulation educators, we have got debriefing skills and we can bring those into clinical environments and help others and ourselves reflect on everyday situations from which we can learn. So I understand the focus has shifted from the more traditional use of simulation, which was used to train students to become nurses, medical doctors, midwives, etc. That's one of the uses of simulation. The thing is, the more we know about this uh, technique or methodology, the more that we find different ways in which it can be useful to us to grow as uh, healthcare practitioners, to grow as educators, and, and, and to look after our patients better. There are so many ways in which we can do that. So, in many ways, can you claim that simulation has gone from being a pure teaching tool to becoming one of the standard tools available in your toolbox to improve treatment? Well, very much so. I mean, that is the case. Uh, my, my particular background uh, is in anesthetics. And if you look at the postgraduate curricula in anesthetics, they do include simulation as part of something that you're expected to live with because, you know, it's just so, so useful. And it allows you to have some consistency in content uh, and some replicability in content that you might or might not have in clinical environments uh, and in life as such. So there is no doubt that in undergraduate settings, in postgraduate settings, and overall in improvement settings, simulation is just being, as you say, one more tool. So we had this big change this year and we've seen a lot of happy faces. Now there is next year's conference. It hasn't been uh, uh, made public yet where that's going to be. Yes, it has. It has? Yes, it's going to be in Prague. It will be celebrating 30 years of SESAM as a society and 30 years of supporting 
excellent healthcare through simulation. So that will be our theme, and we're starting to prepare some very, very exciting collaborative sessions for then. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. The CSM program consists of many things. In addition to the program in the main lecture hall, several smaller workshops are available throughout the conference. I came across two Scots who had just finished their workshop and was happy to explain what their workshop was all about. Hi, my name's Lucy Hutton. I am an advanced retrieval practitioner with uh, the Emergency Medical Retrieval Service based in Scotland. Hello, my name is Doug Maxwell. I'm one of the consultants in pre-hospital and retrieval medicine based with the Emergency Medical Retrieval Service from Scotland also. Uh, so we're here this year at uh, CESAM in Lisbon uh, to present a workshop on our um, bespoke uh, translational simulation package, which we have uh, devised uh, recently within our service. Um, in a nutshell, what we are doing is using simulation uh, as a means to test our clinical governance systems to identify any areas of latent risk within our governance systems, um, a specific management of a, a, a paediatric medical presentation in a critical care setting. Um, we would raise a, or create a simulation profile based on testing the pre-designated governance and cognitive offload. We would run the simulation for a number of iterations using different teams, uh, structured debrief following those, and then any um, outstanding or clear themes, and then actioned accordingly. Um, you know, a, a requirement adjusting a, a guideline, for example, or uh, recalibrate an action card to make it more user-friendly uh, when is required in the heat of the moment, as, a, as an example. I'm sure I'm not the only one who does not know much about the Scottish Emergency Medical Retrieval Service. So I asked Lucy to explain what this unique Scottish service actually was. So there's two different work streams, I guess, um, you, could, you could say that we do. So we have our, our primary work, which is um, our 999 calls. So we would respond to um, critically unwell patients in the community through either uh, traumatic reasons or critically unwell due to some sort of medical etiology that require some pre-hospital critical care. So that, that might require um, trans transport by land, it might be transport by helicopter. The second work stream that we do quite often is the, the transfer and retrieval um, side of things, which is um, going to collect, uh, stabilise and transfer patients from their more rural um, and remote healthcare sites, so the highlands, the islands, where quite often these patients have reached the ceiling of care that the healthcare provider has been able to offer. So our role would be going to those healthcare facilities getting involved with the patients, um, either giving them medications, intubating them, anaesthetic, whatever they need to make them in a more stable, appropriate condition to then transfer over to a bigger healthcare facility on the mainland. And 999, of course, that is the British emergency telephone number. Yes. I must say, I was intrigued by what I heard. So naturally, I wanted to know if they believed that this way of using the simulation tool had led to any improvement which benefited the patient or the service. We very much see this as a work in progress um, and that's, again, one of the main reasons why we're here in Lisbon today um, to learn from uh, a, a number of other individuals and experts. Uh, we have, um, through throughout the, the, the term that the simulation package has been running, we have identified uh, areas of latent risk within our governance system um, and, and bearing in mind that um, this is a, a prospective or proactive approach to clinical governance uh, to, to try and seek out where those uh, risks are. We have managed to uh, make changes, for example, introducing new medications to uh, the, the standardised medication that we would carry, um, reflecting on uh, clinical guidelines and redesigning them for e easier, easier operability of, of use uh, at times of high stress, essentially. Um, a lot of what we do relies upon the ease of ability of cognitive aids and cognitive offloading during times of, of high stress um, clinical scenarios and the, the simulations are designed to test our individual teams uh, during those stressful times so they are 
uh, highly stressful simulations that we do run, but there's a reason for that is because we need to identify the systems that we have in place to try and help people uh, to offload that cognitive burden during the stress. I'm a bit intrigued uh, with this uh, this organisation that you work in uh, as well, because you must come across quite a few of challenges uh, in your line of work just to be able to help people with uh, with things that for people living closer to, or say like in a major city, it's not a problem at all. Yeah, absolutely. So there, there's the around about 95 inhabited islands uh, in and around the, the Scottish coast um, who will have uh, you know, varying populations on those islands and with that uh, varying um, degrees of, uh, of, of health, established healthcare facilities. Um, the, the clinicians on these islands uh, clearly have a, a very challenging task on their hands when it comes to uh, you know, working in uh, relatively austere and remote environments, particularly if, if they're on an island where immediate help is not down the road uh, and, and inevitably requires access either by air or by sea sometimes. So um, that poses a significant logistical a challenge and burden on uh, on the you know the clinicians and also the patients, of course, who are the, the main priority here. So, um, the 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 landscape of Scotland is, is is vast. The possibility to go to have to attend, for example, a critically injured patient in the middle of nowhere is uh, fairly high up on our list of things possibly to happen. So, we uh, we have to be prepared for that, um, and we use simulation. Uh, to replicate those austere environments or the lack of immediate help um, to uh, assess our team's capabilities of dealing with things autonomously. Well, Douglas Maxwell and Lucy Hotton, thank you very much for your time here at uh, the CESAM conference in Portugal. This is a One Million Lives podcast by Laredal Medical. We can't really make an episode like this without getting some feedback from some of the ordinary participants at the conference, the people which this conference was made for. So here is a selection from Italy, Singapore, Sweden and UK. Enjoy. So I am standing here with uh, Serena uh, from Italy. So Serena, what do you think about this year's uh, CESAM conference? Well, first of all, it's, it's huge. It's way bigger than last year's. So many people from all over the world, not just Europe, and this is like another difference, I guess. Um, there are um, like to- like in- intervention for everyone, like talk, short talk. So new researchers speaking about the research, uh, companies talking. Uh, there are very like there is something for anyone. So no matter if you're an educator or a clinician or an engineer like me, uh, you you're gonna find uh, like a content specifically tailored to you, and this is something I really like. Is there something uh, particular you want to mention that uh, impressed you or made a, a big impact? Well, um, I think that there is more, I don't know like what is your experience, but I think there is more interest toward like the um, state of the art technology. So people are talking more about mannequin again. So there is some sort of like more attention, like standardized patients. And this is something that last year was not I, I don't. I, I couldn't like experience because everyone was like toward the uh, like technology, but I think right now like a, a really cool uh, like uh, concept this year is that the like the state of the art matters. So that was something I enjoyed. Thank you, Serena. You're very welcome. So I'm standing here with uh, three ladies from Singapore, uh, and um, I would like to ask the same question to you. What do you think about this year's uh, Sesame Conference? I think it has been amazing to be able to meet uh, fellow uh, healthcare educators and to learn from what uh, learn from best practices of what they are doing, and so then to be, really be inspired and to bring it back to Singapore to see how we can adapt some of these practices. It's very inclusive, like you get to talk to people from different professional uh, background, and you get to learn from each other. Yeah, this is my first time to see some. And I'm just uh, very heartwarming to see that, you know, the community is very encouraging and very uh, welcoming. I'm standing here with Klaus Karl Geren from the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Um, so what do you think about this year's uh, CESAM conference? We have been talking about that. We're actually very pleased with this conference. 
for many reasons. It's um, compared to many, many other conferences, it's more focused on the topic that we're interested in all simulation. And w what we really appreciate is that it, it gathers people with different backgrounds and professions. There's less of a hierarchy because there's not one group who is the, the sort of experts and the other ones are associates or assistants or uh, helping. We're all experts coming from different perspectives, which uh, this, uh, I think it, it, it leads to a good type of discussion. Is this your first uh, conference? No, but it's been a while. I, um, I was to the one in Copenhagen in 2007, I think, uh, so it's been many years ago. I don't think I've been in maybe one uh, in between, but no, it's not the first one. But I'm definitely coming back. May I ask what you do uh, in, in your day-to-day -day business uh, at home? I'm a researcher mainly in uh, medical education and uh, technology-enhanced learning, but m mostly simulation, and that's exactly why I'm so pleased to be here because that's the focus. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm standing here with Kara Swain, also from the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, but you are not Swedish. No, I'm British. I'm a British surgeon who happens to be doing a PhD at the Karolinska. Is this your first uh, CESAM? It is my first CESAM conference and I have to say it's been really enjoyable. In fact, I think it's probably been the best conference I've ever been to and I've been a doctor for more than 10 years. Uh, I've really enjoyed that CISAM has managed to bring together a really diverse group of people from all backgrounds. There's really been no evidence of any hierarchy here among the people. And we've all come together with a common goal, which is the interest of developing simulation. And I've never experienced an atmosphere like that at any other conference. We are here at the end of CESAM. And I'm, I'm fortunate to have with me Elsa Soylan, who's the director of the Safer Simulation Center. Hi, Elsa. Hi, nice to be here. Thank you. So at this end of this year, CESAM, I just wanted to sort of hear from you, what are your general impressions from this year about the conference and the venue? Or... I think it has been a great conference. There has been participants from all over the globe, actually. Right. Yeah, as always. And also meet old and yeah. old colleagues or friends from all over the world that, that I have met uh, on earlier CESAM. So yeah, because which CESAM is this for you? You've been to quite a few. I have not counted them all, but since 2008, I have been to almost each and every CESAM conference. And it's, of course, really nice to be back after COVID to yeah. keep up. Um, it's good to see people's faces again. Right? Yes, yeah. yes, really, really nice. No, so the enthusiasm is, as always, uh, great. And I think the field is, is moving forward. Uh, with really interesting, uh, I really like the, the, the keynotes. Say more about that. What, what, what stuck out for you? It was interesting to hear um, Lars Konge yeah. and uh, Liesl. Liesl. Liesl, Liesl, yes. And uh, they are doing a great job there yeah. at Kames in, in uh, skills uh, yeah. training especially. They also do assessment of their right. participants. And that was actually the one session that stood out a bit for me too. Um, it was a bit. Uh, it was a bit different in a way yeah. than many of the others. Yeah. I don't know if that speaks more to this session or the general program. Yeah. But they were sort of in a way quite humble in saying we don't we don't know everything, but we have some data on something. Yeah. And they actually presented some hard facts, some data. Yeah. And, and the fact that they do assessments, I yeah. think that, that's interesting. Yeah. What, what, why, why did that stand out for you? No, I think it's, it was interesting to, to hear their um, approach in yeah. doing assessment. Yeah. Uh, that was interesting. Right. And also some of the results. Yeah. Yeah. And also um, the fact that what is competency-based education? Yes. And how do you assess that? Mm. Or uh, how do you assess the the outcome yeah. when they have done training. Our focus here at Safer has very much been about the uh, team's simulation. Yeah. And it's uh, we also see the need to do more assessment in that type of training. Right. But it's really hard to do so. Lars and, and Liesl, they were also clear that it, it's hard to do so. Yes, so, they admitted that. Yeah, they admitted that. And uh, so what, what could be the next step? They made an interesting statement. And it was something along the lines of there are very few research proven standards for assessments and i think that is probably where the battle needs to be won right now it's, it yeah. seems to be 
we can assess based on whatever. Yeah. But is that proven somehow, that framework? Works. Which, yeah. Yeah. So we need to mm. kind of uh, verify. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So they were also clear about that. Yeah. So that also might be the next step. Yeah. yeah. I was very uh, intrigued by the fact that they had um, healthcare quality improvement on the program. Yeah. Was that new this year? Yeah, it, it was new that they had a, a key lecture okay. on that topic. Yeah. Yeah. I like that and I also like that they have made they have done a tremendous job in uh, was it in Bristol? Yeah. Or in in uh, UK mm. where they have uh, made this uh, framework right on how to do this uh, stepwise. But I also see simulation as um, more and more important tool to do quality improvement. And we, we also have done that uh, in our I know yeah and you, you actually been do having some fantastic results for instance in stroke treatment and, and others but but that brings me to the question sort of looking ahead now to the next CSAMs what, what do we need to see more of what we need I, I think and I really think it is important to connect simulation to clinical work right and to see that we uh, really increase quality and competence with real patients and that we can show that by research and uh, right. and uh, projects yeah. yeah but also to use more data right or feedback yeah digital tools or yeah. feedback right that can guide you how to improve your uh, right your uh, competence because in a way it ties back to the notion of quality improvement where i guess you would need that kind of data from simulation too to tie into clinical work yeah. and also if we can use the uh, same type of data uh, clinical data so that we can compare and see where are the gaps so what i'm hearing is you you actually advocating for the simulation community to t- take a step closer to clinical work yeah and become players in quality improvement yeah or to use data feedback both in uh, both clinical data yeah. but also training data yeah to kind of improve your, your practice. And, and that was probably what stood out for me. I was at this year's IMSH yeah. conference in the yeah. US too. And there seems to be a heavier weight on outcome-focused research yeah. at IMSH. That was just my sort of gut feeling when I when I joined CSM this year. Yes, uh, I'm quite... But now I have not attended all the sessions at CSAM sure. and also spe- especially the, the, the research um, sirens uh, yeah. sessions. Yeah. I didn't attend those. Mm. So maybe it, they kind of uh, had a, another focus there. Sure. But in the keynotes and uh, the sessions that I took part in uh, did not highlight that that much. I agree. Yeah. There, there seemed to be a breakthrough focus, yeah. but not necessarily follow through or yeah. sort of what does this mean? How can we scale? How can we? Uh, yeah. yeah. Interesting. So will you go next year? Yes, up? yes, I will. It's really nice to be a part of this society yeah. uh, and meet up with uh, colleagues all over the continent, actually. And also, it's it also nice that our um, society here in Stavanger also had um, presentations and workshops. Yes. So that's also um, valuable to us. Yeah. And also kind of uh, have a feeling of the temperature of, of where are we. Yeah. And I believe Safer had quite a few uh, presentations, yes, right? Yes, yeah. it did. It, it develops us. Yeah. yeah. I, I believe so. Yeah. You can get the feedback and test your ideas. And- exactly. Yeah. I'm not sure if I'm going next year, but uh, if I'm allowed to, uh, if I can, uh, I'll see you there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Elsa. Bye. You have been listening to a special event episode of the One Million Lives podcasts by Lairdahl, recorded on location at the 2023 Congress of the Society for Simulation in Europe. You have been listening to a One Million Lives podcast by Lairdahl. You can find all our podcasts and access any bonus material on lairdahl.com slash podcast. The views, information, or opinions expressed are those of the guests and do not necessarily represent those of the institution they are affiliated with or of Lairdahl Medical. If you have any suggestions for guests or topics we should cover, please send us a message on lairdahl.com slash podcast. We look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, goodbye from the Lairdahl podcast team.